Breaking It Down with Frank McKay. This is 1039 LI News Radio. I'd like to welcome everyone to Breaking It Down. This is Frank McKay, but more importantly, our very special guest is the Vice President of Enthelio Healthcare Solutions, Carolyn Rubin. Carolyn, uh, let's start from the beginning. Let's get a little bit of your history. Where were you born and where were you raised? I uh, was born in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was raised in Rockport, Missouri, and I currently reside in Fort Worth, Texas. How about your folks? What did your mom and dad do for a living? My dad sold insurance, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom because there were six of us kids. (laughs) Do you think the fact that your father was in the insurance business had any influence on you going into the medical field? Um. Definitely got me into the sales end of my life and and into the different roles that I played, whether it was selling real estate or um, being on the healthcare side in the retail sector. Definitely had an influence there. How much of what you do with revenue cycle management now is done in a modern way, or more specifically, how much of it is done through the internet? There, you know, it goes both directions. There's a lot that's being captured uh, via the Internet and getting the different um, plans updated, getting the different policies. Everybody right now tries to do everything online. So you're going to get the, the um, payments for the patients when they've been seen or the prior authorization so a patient can be treated. Most of that anymore is done via online um, or Internet access. With all the recent changes in regards to how the federal government deals with the healthcare industry, it seems like everything is lined up perfectly on the internet. Or is it by their design, or is it just the natural order of things? Is that, is that just where we are as a society? That was pretty much a natural cycle that was happening anyway. It was all going down that path. Um, I mean, definitely the federal government had different in, um plans that they put into place to get the providers to move probably quicker than what they may have, you know, it's allowed them to have some additional revenue to to pay for the electronic medical records and the, the entire system that they had to put into place, and so it helped to offset some of the cost. Um, so definitely probably added a little bit there as far as them doing it sooner than later, but we were always headed down the path of the internet. It's the only way you can get things done anymore. Let me give a reminder to folks listening that if you're just turning on your radio now, or if you're just tuning into us, this is Frank McKay, but more importantly, Carolyn Rubin is the vice president of Enthelio Healthcare Solutions. And she is as good at what she does as anybody in the country, anybody in the world, quite frankly, she's award-winning. And she is also featured in Talk Nation, the magazine 2016, uh, February edition, 2016, Talk Nation. You could read all about Carolyn. It is very flattering, but it also was very accurate. It's a wonderful story about a woman who's had a terrific career and still going very, very strong. So, Carolyn, 25 years, you've been at this for 25 years. Other than what we've talked about already, what are some of the changes that have happened since you've started? Oh, my. Um, It's quite a bit different from when I first started. I mean, when I first started, everything was done by paper. Uh, You would get on the phone to the insurance company in order to um, get the prior authorization or the referral. You would send the claims in through the post office. You would actually print out the claims and fold them up and put them in an envelope and out the door they would go, uh, say, you know, same way with your statements. And now today everything is done with an electronic file. So you just put the charges in the system and hit a button and off they go through the clearinghouse and right on to the payer and you've got your money within you know, 28 to 45 days. But in the old days it wasn't like that. Everything in, and even when I first got into it, a lot of the claim forms we were filling out with typewriters. So, I mean, the sure. – the smaller plans that didn't have the capability of, of doing things online or um, the smaller systems, you went to the typewriter and you were putting it all on there. 
Carolyn, you mentioned typewriters. It's almost a funny word nowadays. When was the last time you actually saw or heard of a typewriter being used in your field? Oh, my. Um, that's probably been about seven years ago, ten years ago. Uh, you have to remember I work with providers from east to west and north to south, and some of those are one doc offices that, you know, their computer system is is probably, you know, ancient as well. And so a lot of them upgraded, has upgraded or was forced to upgrade in the last several years that you know, there were still individuals that were still using typewriters, not to the extent that we did when I first got into healthcare, but, you know, still capturing maybe a secondary insurance claim that had to go out the door or, you know, capturing some of the claim forms or um, authorization request, they were still using that. But, um, you know, for the most part, everyone's uh, online or at least on the computer filling everything out. I'm sure there are many people that you deal with that are on the elderly side as well. And, again, I certainly don't want to perpetuate any negative stereotypes, but many older people uh, aren't as up on the technology as, as the younger folks are. And I'd like to ask you if most of these people who are not tech savvy, do they usually have a loved one or a, a provider, some type of healthcare provider that allows you to deal with them? Do you, do you deal with either of those situations? It, it's both. You run into both actually. I mean, most of the time, there's a family member that's with their um, parents or their grandparents, especially if they know that there's going to be some challenges that may come into play. So there, you know, hopefully is either a friend or a caretaker that's with them. But then that said, we have a lot that are snowbirds that we might see. So they live in one place, and that's where their family's at. And then in the wintertime, they're going to a warmer place. Uh, so, you know, they're still trying to do everything on their own, and they get in there and, and it's very important for the individuals that work at the provider's office or work at the hospitals to keep in mind that these individuals, while they may have a smartphone, they have one because maybe a child gave it to them, and they know just really how to look at their text messages and, and how to make phone calls. Or if they have a computer, you know, is it mainly for emails and, and to sit down and play some games, but do they even own a printer to print out the registration forms that they need to fill out. Very important that that be kept in mind and um, something that I'm always reminding the, the offices when I go in and meet with them because that's where patients will get frustrated, especially our older population. They don't have all of the, the toys or the tools that we're used to having um, as, you know, we all grown into the computers or grown up with computers. So it's, it's definitely a challenge at times. Another quick reminder, Frank McKay with Carolyn Rubin. She's the vice president of Enthelio Healthcare Solutions, and solutions is what she handles when it comes to healthcare. And off mic and off camera, I've spoken to you, and I know you a little bit about your backstory, and you had the, the illness of a beloved grandfather, your grandfather, who you were very, very close with, that got you thinking about this field and ultimately he passed from cancer. How much of that experience of you dealing with your grandfather's sickness and then passing led to you going into this field? Uh, that was a big influence, getting into healthcare um, and being able to work with family members and, and work with fam friends and, and just even individuals that I didn't know. Um, it, it was a very big reason for me getting into healthcare. When I first went into the healthcare sector, I actually started out in retail pharmacy. And it was working with um, customers there and talking to patients there and, and trying to help them understand their illness or what they were dealing with. It became very apparent I needed to be more on the um, practice and facility side than I needed to be in retail pharmacy. So that's when I went back to school and got my degree, went into um, medical assisting and, and on into the revenue cycle role that, I, that I'm that i in today. But it 
really was the the big driver because then as my grandparents became ill, as my grandfather was diagnosed with cancer and um, it, it was the ability to be able to be that caregiver for them and to be able to help them understand what they were going through. Um, it's it's very near and dear to my heart. Unfortunately, I, I've lost both my, my parents and all of my grandparents and during those processes, you have to meet with and deal with so many people, and a lot of those people do not have a great bedside manner. It's it's so cold and and calculating and just rush you through. And I would imagine those are ill-fitted people for this this business. Now, you're in charge of finding people and putting them in the right spots and managing those situations. How often do you find an ill-fitted person in this field and, and you have to make some kind of decision to move them? There are those. I mean, sometimes it's, it's individuals get into a role and they think it's what they want to do and they find out that maybe they're just not in the right fit or they're not in the right role. Um, but many times what I find is that they just don't have the true understanding of the of the position, of the role, of the job that they're in, and the impact that they have for patients as well. So it's mentoring those individuals, helping them understand that what they do and how they do things truly impacts a patient's experience. And when you're dealing with individuals that are not feeling well from the patient side, regardless of what is going on with them, they need to understand and they need to know that you on the other side of the counter understand how they're feeling and, you know, what what might be impacting them at any given time. So whether they're there for an earache or whether they're there for follow-up to their cancer, um, it doesn't matter. Everybody that shows up at a physician office, everyone that shows up at a facility needs to know that we understand what they are going through and we're there to provide the best experience for them because they don't need anything else to worry about. They just want to get better. Um, so it's, it's identifying those individuals to see are they in the right role and just need additional training and mentoring or do we need to look at what their strengths are and move them into a position that may be more suited for them. But it, it, it's tough sometimes. I mean, when individuals get into the healthcare, they're not quite sure what they want to do because they really don't know what the position holds until they get in there and actually get their feet wet. And then they realize that, you know, I either like it or maybe I don't. And it's working with them to see where's the right fit for them because they all bring something to the table which will truly bring benefit to a patient. It's just identifying what that role is. Carolyn Rubin is the voice that you're hearing. And you studied pharmacy early on. Was your original intention to become a pharmacist? No, I actually um, started out on the retail pharmacy as a pharmacy tech. And in the state of Nebraska, I was actually one of the very first technicians to be certified by the state of Nebraska in uh, pharmacy. They, that was the first year that they had rolled it out. Uh, and I was in that role for about four years, and during that time, I went back to school, and I was uh, I went to a technical school called Vermont College of Health Careers, and I graduated at the top of my class as a medical assistant, went on to become certified as a medical assistant, and then actually took classes towards uh, um, physician assistant program, but uh, ended up really just advancing in my career where I was at, and I just fell in love with what I was doing. So I did not pursue the, the full PA degree, but uh, had enough of the the training and the schooling to truly understand, you know, again, what are patients going through and, and to get that medical background on between the pharmacy side and the medical assisting training and, the, and those courses that I took for the physician assistants where I could really sit down and have conversations, whether it was with physicians, whether it was with patients, whether it was with staff, that to really be able to help them understand what they were going through and, and figure out how we could make it a um, better experience for them, 
even though they were dealing with a lot on um, the clinical side and whatever their disease was, it became very important and, and more of a, of a goal for me, a lifelong goal, to ensure that patients received um, 100% care when they would walk in, whether it be into a hospital or into a physician's office, so the physician may provide the best quality medical care to that patient. I wanted to make sure that they had the best quality financial care as well. So they realistically could focus on getting better and take out the stress and the frustration that sometimes the financial piece can bring, which really does not help them um, all that much when it comes to them being able to focus on just, you know, what they need to do to get better. So it's it's a lifelong goal of mine to ensure that um, patients can have that quality care whenever they go in and wherever they go to be seen. For those just joining us, there's, uh, there's still more to come with Carolyn Rubin, Frank McKay here. Let me explain what you, you may have missed. Carolyn Rubin is, for the last 25 years, uh, has been an expert in revenue cycle management, and she is as good as you can get at what she does. She's the vice president currently of Anthelio Healthcare Solutions, and she, again, is uh, is speaking to us from from Texas. Always thrilled to get her take. In the second half, we're going to talk a little bit about the Affordable Health Care Act uh, or Obamacare and what people need to know about that. The issue that everyone should pick up is February 2016's issue of Talk Nation, and there's a wonderful feature in there of this of this woman who's an expert in her field. And it's very flattering, but it's very accurate and just just terrific uh, person to talk to on this. Again, Frank McKay, Carolyn Rubin has been our very special guest and will continue to be our special guest. We're going to take a quick break and more with Carolyn Rubin. Breaking it down with Frank McKay. This is 1039 LI News Radio. I'd like to welcome everyone back to Breaking It Down. This is Frank McKay, but more importantly, our very special guest is the Vice President of Anthelio Healthcare Solutions, and she is an award-winning medical administrative professional, and she has had a 25-year career. Her name is Carolyn Rubin, and we want to welcome you back, Carolyn. How important do you think it is to attract people to work in your field? Is there a glut? of people in the field, or is there a need for people, or is there somewhere in between? What's the current status of the workforce in the medical administration field? Uh, There's actually a very big need for healthcare professionals right now in a multitude of positions, whether it's uh, the actual provider, uh, getting a healthcare provider in place, or if it's a medical assistant, nurses, down to your administrative staff, your coders, the billers, Every role right now is so important with all the changes that are going on with healthcare and the changes in the government policies and in reimbursement. And there's several people having to do more with less. So we want to get good qualified individuals into the healthcare sector. But there is a definite need in every area, in every position within the healthcare sector. Well, what is there to entice people to the field? I guess it's obvious, or at least it's obvious to me, that the population is living longer. Therefore, there are more people, and there is certainly a need for health care where, wherever we go and with all of us. And we will need some type of health care professionals to deal with it, uh, you know, certainly eventually. Is it a well-paying field? Can it be lucrative? You work your way up the ladder. Um, some of the positions will start out at lesser money than others, but the more experience you achieve, the more um, knowledge that you achieve, the higher the pay scale as they go along. So there are very entry-level positions that, you know, whether you're starting out as a receptionist or if you're starting out um, as a scheduler, you may even start out in the coding arena 
everyone has to start somewhere. So there's always the entry level positions, and those are going to pay less than what some of your more senior positions pay. But there's so much growth opportunity within the healthcare field. And the nice thing about it is so many of the providers and the hospitals have plans in place for tuition reimbursement to uh, allow their employees to achieve additional certifications or additional training. And with that knowledge, with that growth, comes more um, more money, higher you know, higher paychecks, and and actually higher satisfaction within the practice or within the facility itself too, because they know that they're not just stuck in one position for the rest of their lives. They can move around. They can, and the nice thing about it, that training, that knowledge, that education can go from city to city, state to state. So if they decide they want to up and move from North Dakota to Florida, they can take that with them and still have a job for a field that they can get into very easily. I'm here with the vice president of Anthelio Healthcare Solutions, someone who is uh, just an expert in the field, award-winning vice president of Anthelio Healthcare Solutions, Carolyn Rubin. And I'll remind folks also, if they want to read more on Carolyn, that Talk Nation has featured her in the February 2016 edition, and it's a it's just a fantastic depiction of her and the work that she's been doing for all of these years. Frank McKay here, but more importantly, again, Carolyn Rubin. You've been in this field for 25 years. Do you think that you've embedded yourself in in a role and there's nothing else for you to do? Or is there is there something that you'd like to involve, uh, to evolve into beyond your current position? There's always areas I want to grow and experience. I, I will um, tell you I am one of those individuals who loves to continue to learn and loves to continue to grow within any type of um, role. There's so many opportunities within the healthcare sector and whether it's staying within revenue cycle, whether it's actually just getting into my own consulting business or um, taking what I know and really passing that on to others, continue to mentor individuals to where they can grow because to me that's the greatest success is when I can take what I know and pass it on to someone else and watch them grow within their own um, arena as well and be able to watch them gain the skill set and gain the confidence that they need. I still, I, I love public speaking. I do that today. I get out and speak at webinar or seminars and conferences and conventions, but I want to do more of that and in, in a larger role than what I currently do today. So that's probably where my next step will take me is to get more into the public speaking and to continue the mentoring and the education and, and the awareness of what goes on within healthcare and, and to bring to the public, bring to the facilities or to the physician that knowledge that can make it a more positive experience for everyone that's involved. In general, are you happy with the direction that healthcare is going in in this country? I am. I think there's still some opportunity to streamline. I think there's still some opportunity to make things better and easier for patients to get the care that they need. There's still a lot of red tape that comes into play sometimes, um, which can delay treatment, can actually cause a denial for a treatment for a patient if they don't have the right type of insurance. So I think there's still lots of areas of opportunity, but we are going the right direction. Well, that's good to know. As you know, everyone knows, or most people know, Michael Moore, filmmaker Michael Moore, had made a documentary, and he implied, more than implied, that Canadian health care was much or far superior than, than the American health care uh, system. And when I speak to professionals and doctors and nurses and, and folks in your field about this, uh, they deny it. Uh, they, they completely deny it and, and say that the American health care system is better than any out there. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I would have to agree. Um, I think we have more opportunities 
it, it's a different healthcare arena. I mean, it, their process is set up differently. The way you get your healthcare is handled differently there. There's um, a lot of individuals that really kind of make the decision for the patient when it comes down to the payers. Um, so, so there are, I think, a lot more opportunities for patients to get the care that they need here in the United States. I think that they have better access to the physicians that they need. So there's not a uh, better term and they're not driven to one particular provider. They actually can seek out who they want to go to here in the United States. So there's more options, more opportunities. Um, so I, I do. I think we are much more superior to than the Canadian healthcare. While they may have a few nuances that we don't, I think 99.9% um, .9 of it, we pretty much trump. Have you done much traveling outside the United States? I have. Um, I recently came back from Belize. I uh, took a week and, and had a fabulous time in Belize, and and uh, we took uh, went to the Mediterranean last year, and you know really went to um, different areas. We were in Venice, we were in Rome, we were in Tuscany. So it's you know getting out and seeing what the rest of the world has to offer, and and some of the challenges that they also. Um, encounter while we're there and we have some really good friends that live in London and their challenges today that they're having um, is much more than what we would ever dream about when it comes to getting the type of care or be, having access to the type of care that we need so um, I feel blessed that we have the resources and the opportunities for the health care and the type of treatment that we have here because it, it truly is different um, outside of the United States. Here's another reminder. This is Frank McKay, but more importantly, Carolyn Rubin is our very special guest, award-winning uh, medical administrative professional, and she knows more about the healthcare system than any person that I know personally. And let me ask you, in, on the subject of traveling, if someone was traveling outside of the United States, would there be an urgency to get back here if they were to fall ill or something horrible was to happen? In other words, is our health care here generally transferable to other countries? No, there's a difference. I mean, if you, if you fell ill and you're traveling, so for example, when we were in Belize or, or in Venice, the, the health care system, well, you can call the insurance company, you can let them know you're traveling, um, they will be able to, you know, assist with that most of the time, though, if you're overseas, you're paying for your health care services, whatever is then provided to you. And then when you get back to the state, you can submit that into your insurance. There may be a few entities, uh, more of the big hospital groups, if you happen to be in the big areas, that would be willing to, you know, work with your insurance company, submit those claims for you. But it is different. I mean, it's Anytime you travel outside of the United States, you run into challenges. So it's just like um, taking your cell phone out of the United States, and if you don't have international coverage, you can't use your cell phone. So it's, you know, making sure that you have the right type of coverage if you are going to be making those trips. And so it's very much worth the time to call the insurance company and ask the questions because they can get you set up with what you need or at least give you the information that you need to take with you in case something would happen. Carolyn, if there's a checklist that we should have, how high on that checklist is having a health care proxy? Oh, it's probably right in the top five, <laughs> I would say. Some may argue that. They may say there's much more. Um, but it's very important that your health care needs can be met um, you never know what situation may arise. You never know, um, you know, what might happen. So you always want to make sure your I's are dotted and T's are crossed. You want to have your um, health care proxy. You want to make sure that you have a living will. You want to make sure that anyone and everyone close to you knows what, you, um, what your desires are if you would become ill and not be able to see for yourself. So it's very important to take care of all of that. 
um, and not leave anything to chance. What else would be on that list? I would imagine, you know, how much coverage you need, how much coverage you have. But what else, from your from your mind, should be high up on that list? Well, I think number one is is making sure that you have everything in order, right? So I'm I'm a big believer in making sure you have your will and your living will, and um, you know, make sure you have a, a good um, documentation of whether or not you want to be a donor. An organ donor, make sure that you um, have a DNR in place, to, depending on what your what your thoughts and, and feelings are about that. Um, and, and I think also more importantly is making sure that you have that rainy day fund for health care. We see so many plans that are changing, and, and now being January, a lot of individuals are going to be seeing that, whether their deductible went up or their copay has went up or, you know, they have more, less coverage for more um, treatments that they may need. So it's making sure that you have that health care fund set up, but, you know, whether it's through the employer, whether you're going through a bank, you know, make sure you have a health savings account of some sort in place as well, because you never know when you're going to need to fall back on that. I know the subject had become a political football over the, the the last six and seven seven years, but the Affordable Health Care Act, or otherwise known as Obamacare, I guess originally in places like California was a little chaotic, but recently it looks like it's found its legs and is much less chaotic. Is it getting better? Is it getting easier? The Affordable Care Act, I think, is getting more momentum. It's, it's um, I think it is getting its legs. There are several plans however, that were in place last year that are no longer in place because the insurance companies just stopped offering them, mostly because they just were not um, advantageous for the payer to carry. It was too costly for them to carry those plans. So, and, and most of the payers, when they rolled out the plans for the Affordable Care Act, everybody wanted in, and so they created maybe 15 different versions of plans that they would carry, and, and this year they've streamlined it down to maybe three. The problem that I see with the Affordable Care Act is twofold. One, there's so many varieties out there, and if, if the individuals, if the people do not totally understand what they're getting themselves into, while they may not be paying much for a premium, they're paying a lot out of pocket when it comes to co-pays and deductibles. There's, there's still the subsidy money, so for those who make less than poverty or poverty level or below, there is the subsidy money to where they can get help with those premiums. But, again, the problem with that is that coverage may not be the most ideal um, because throwing them into a different category. And so there's maybe more prior authorizations or uh, more time in order to be able to get their treatments, and they're limited to a number of providers that they can go see. The other issue that I see with the Affordable Care Act plans, some of them anyway that are out there, is they're on what's called a month-to-month. -month. So in other words, I could take out a policy today, and I can pay the premium for that policy, and it's in place for 30 days. If I don't pay the premium on the due date, I have a, like a two-week window where I can make that premium up, and I still have coverage. But if I neglect to get that premium in, well, now my coverage is lapsed, and I no longer have health insurance. So if a patient happens to be in the hospital, for example, and they can't make that premium or no one's aware that that needs to be done, then their insurance could lapse, and the patient's not even aware of it. Cool. They're already in the hospital. So now the insurance company submits the claims. They may get paid for some services but not for all. And now it becomes patient responsibility. So there's some real big nuances or loopholes within it that the patients or the, the people need to be aware of, but a lot of the times they're not. Let me remind everyone who just may be tuning in that we have been speaking with Carolyn Rubin, who is the vice president of Anthelio Healthcare Solutions, and she is an award-winning professional in her field. Just a tremendous amount of information here from Carolyn Rubin, Frank McKay here, but more importantly, Carolyn has been here educating us for the last 
hour or so. And let me ask you this, Carolyn. If you were to pick an amount of dates that you would like to spend out there on the road, public speaking, what would be that magic number? What would be your perfect number? I actually can work my schedule. I mean, I, most of the time I'm speaking at conferences, and it's usually over a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But just depending on the need and the request, it can be any day of the week. I have, um, speak early in the morning. I've spoken late at night. Uh, if it's, you know, for breakfast meetings or for maybe there's dinner engagements and they're bringing physicians around the table. If I'm speaking at conferences, it's sometimes the opening presentation. Other times it might be the, the over the lunch hour when they're just trying to get some informative information to them. Really cool. open. It just depends on the engagement and, and the need. And I try to work my schedule around to, to be able to accommodate. I'd like to thank Carolyn Rubin for being our very special guest and breaking it all down for us. Frank McKay here. Uh, Carolyn, how do people follow you or get in touch with you? Can you give us any websites that you have? And how does somebody reach you? I am out on LinkedIn um, under Carolyn Rubin. And then I'm also on Twitter. And um, I put all of my postings and any of the education articles that, that I put together always goes out on LinkedIn and Twitter, and, and I'm also on Facebook. Um, that's probably the best place to, to find me is out on LinkedIn at this point in time um, or through the, the Twitter accounts. And I am very receptive to um, any, anybody who wants to connect. I, like I said, I love working with individuals out in the field and being able to mentor or, or just be able to provide guidance in any way um, is always is always a, a love of mine. I want to thank you all for tuning in to Breaking It Down. This is Frank McKay and Carolyn Rubin has been our very special guest. We will see you next time on Breaking It Down.